Georgia Virtue presents the Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong podcast. This is episode 263. This week, we have Tennessee expulsions. Stacy has a new job. Chicago moves to the left. Buckhead City leader splits. Kemp actually used his pen. Inmates walking. RFK Jr. jumping in the presidential race. This Bud's not for you. Trump's charges. And we get an update on Marjorie Taylor Greene. I'm Dave Roberts. With me is my partner's endeavor, State Rep Emeritus Ken Pullen. Yeah, good morning, Dave. How are you? Right side of the ga- grass, brother. Right side of the grass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm recovering from a little sinus cold I picked up last week, cutting grass. So uh, still a little grouchy from that or uh, coughing a little bit, you, but I'm good. And you, you flew with it? Yeah, I flew with that. We uh, took the wife and daughter to New York to see Phantom of the Opera before it went off Broadway and was uh, walking around New York with a terrible sinus cold all week. So I think everybody up there assumed I had COVID the entire time, so nobody came close. Well, that, I, I don't... That's a that's a Yankee thing anyway. Is is uh, is not really. They they don't do what I call the Paulding County handshake, which is a hug. No, there's not a lot of hugs in New York, but we did have really <laughs> great weather. Went to a Yankees game, so that was the first time I've been to Yankee Stadium. That was very enjoyable. And how long of, did you guys make it? Yeah, we uh, we actually stayed for almost the entire game. We went by first to see where Alexander Hamilton's house was which was neat. Alexander Hamilton back in the day lived in lower Manhattan and built a house up close to where Yankee stadium is now. And at that time when he built it, it was all farmland up in Manhattan or up in Harlem is where that house was. So we went by his house to, to see where he hung out later in life before he got shot in a duel with Aaron Burr. And then from there we went over to Yankee stadium. So it was, it was a, yeah, a lot of fun. Yeah, whenever people talk about politics has never been this divisive, is we had a sitting vice president kill <laughs> the former treasury uh, uh, secretary. Yes, in a duel. Yes, and uh, you know Alexander Hamilton's son got shot also in a duel. So that was uh, it's quite an interesting time where people got upset at each other for things that were said, and then they would have a duel to settle the settle the issue. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember where they went. They went across the river, went to New Jersey, where where there was no law about it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's it, plus the the pistols they used were notoriously inaccurate. Right. The fact that that Burr hit him was more an act of luck than anything else. Yep. Yeah, and I but think it, Alexander, the, I think Hamilton actually was trying not to hit Aaron Burr. I think both of them believed they would just have a duel, not hit each other. And then, you know, go about their ways. But that's not what, I, I guess, Aaron Burr had in mind. Right. Yeah, there's there, there's a lot of interesting story about him checking uh, checking the, the light against his glasses and, and mm-hmm. putting up a psychological game. And, and uh, he done got himself shot. <clears throat> so, speaking of, of the divisive nature of politics... We have Tennessee legislators uh, vote to expel two of three members that protested the ca- at the Capitol. <clears throat> yeah, so two, uh, actually three Democrat members coming off the shooting in Tennessee at the private school were protesting uh, and wanted to you know, do away with guns again. They were, they were protesting uh, against guns. And they were not really protesting outside of the Capitol. These members came onto the House floor and used a bullhorn to protest. So as part of that, the Republican legislators in the House brought up expulsion charges and expelled Justin Jones and Justin Peterson from the House. Gloria Johnson was also a member that did it, and she was not voted for expulsion. But two members did get expelled, and this is the first partisan expulsion in the state's history. Yeah, I don't know where I am on that. It's not. It's not just a fifty-fifty vote to to expel a sitting member of of the Tennessee legislature. Uh, is it two thirds? 
I think it's two thirds. And, you know, the two, the two guys that got expelled met that criteria. And the, the lady that didn't get expelled, she was one vote short. You know, I'm like you, I have, uh, at first I thought this was a really bad tactic by the house Republicans to do this. Uh, then I started thinking that I started looking back over the last five years and how Democrats and not necessarily Democrats, but the left has treated Republicans. You know, at some point you have to play, you know, hit fire with fire. And I, I'm not totally against this at this point. These guys did a protest on the Capitol floor with bull horns. Uh, I don't feel sorry for them. They'll, they'll raise $10 million off of this event. They'll run for office again. They'll be back in the Tennessee House chamber next year. Uh, at some point, Republicans have to push back to all the craziness that's going on. I mean, Donald Trump has been, uh, they've been trying to kick Donald Trump out of office for five years now. His entire year, time, time, the entire time he was president, they were trying to kick him out, and now they're still trying to do it. So, yeah, this is, uh, both sides do this. Yeah, I've never, I haven't heard this tactic before because it's not truly a, uh, an impeachment. <clears throat> it's a procedural matter. Yeah, it's just procedural matter. Yep. But look, they they took the well without being recognized. Uh, took over the floor, like you said, with with bullhorns. I mean, yeah. And it, it, what's what's funny is they asked uh, the the member who was not expelled why she thinks that is. And she said it has a lot to do with my skin color. The two the two Justins that were booted, both white guys. Hmm. And Gloria Johnson was not. <clears throat> so that's that's interesting. Yes it is. It was still a close vote. I mean it was close it was close enough to have. But uh she doesn't get the uh get the 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 glory of of being expelled and going back to her constituents and, and raising a ton of money. <laughs> yeah, and it sounds like whoever so there's going to be an appointment process now, and it's going to be done by the local county parties, and uh, they're looking to now to see if the expelled members could just be appointed back to the same job they had before. So Justin and Justin may be back in the Tennessee House as early as next week. If the if the rules in Tennessee permit you to to be appointed to the job you were just kicked out of, so we'll have to see where this goes. Yeah, I mean they they could come right back and be censured, and, and they have no committees. I think they, I think they, they were stripped of all their committees. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> interesting, interesting times. It is. So, Stacey Abrams is move, moving to D.C. Yeah, this exactly. came as a big surprise this week to me, Dave. What, what about yourself? It's where is a little shocking. She's going to be at at Howard University. Uh, would have thought she she would have uh, stayed in Georgia and, and keep that <clears throat> keep that political machine going. I um, agree. I agree. Does this signify that she's done with Georgia politics at this point? I know there was some talk of her running for governor again, but I seem to think this may be her. Uh, on the way out in Georgia at this point. I don't know why she just doesn't run for Congress. I mean, she, I mean, she had the money. She had the, uh, she, she had the ability to, to pick which district she wants to be in. Yep. I think that uh, she, she may consider that job below her though. Uh, she doesn't want to be one out of what? 435. I wonder right. if it's not big enough for her. Could be. Could be, uh, <clears throat> you know, she sees, you know, she sees, uh, you know, Pajama Boy and and Warnock out there, and <clears throat> and she, she's just kind of. It, I, I wonder if she's turned the mirror on herself yet and said, you know, it's I'm the reason I failed. <clears throat> yeah, I don't think that mirror's turned on her yet. I, I still don't think she's blaming everybody else for her failures. But it is interesting. She's going to serve as Howard University's inaugural Ronald W. Walters Endowed Chair for Race and Black Politics. So she's taken, that's the role that she's taken at Howard University in, uh, in the Washington, D.C. area. That's a, that's a lot of words for we made this up for you. It is a lot of words. Hey, look. Yeah, it sounds like they just made hey, up look. a role for Stacy. 
Yeah, and, and for and for Howard, it's 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 a it's a great move. It is. I mean, it's uh, people be lined up to to take any, anything that she's that she is uh, uh, anything she's doing, any of the classes she's teaching. Mm-hmm. So if she's giving a lecture on campus, I guarantee you that room is full. Yep. And it'll 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 be two hours of of her telling them how racist people are in Georgia, and that's why she didn't get elected. I don't have, I, I'm sure that'll be a topic of conversation quite often. So Chicago goes even further to the left with their mayoral race. Yeah, so Brandon Johnson beat Paul, uh, let me see if I get his right, last name correct, Paul Vallis last week in the Chicago mayor runoff. Uh, Brandon Johnson was endorsed by Bernie Sanders. He beat a more conservative Democrat uh, who was really uh, the favorite of many moderate conservative voters. So the guy he beat, Paul, was he promised to expand the police and crack down on crime. The guy that won Brandon Johnson, Bernie Sanders' endorsement, is a defund the police guy. It, it, it just is amazing to me these big cities like New York, Chicago, San Francisco continue going downhill, more violent crime, uh, it's drugs running rampant, and they continue to elect more radical left-wing politicians. I, I don't know at what point do they, again, turn the mirror on themselves and understand why the problem, you know, why are these problems occurring? Again, turning the mirror on, on, on yourself. So, yeah, we did this. We created this. But I don't know. I, 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 I know if, if you watch conservative media, you see a lot of the bad part of Chicago. Uh, and, and we we stand back and go, how in the hell could you keep electing uh, uh, Lori Lightfoot? I mean, she. But th- then you know they show her the door, and people around the country are like, yeah, okay, good. You know, mm-hmm. build build up the Chicago PD again, and, and they go as far left as you can get. Burn just. I'm going to tax the rich. Uh, yep. I guess he's not going to pay police with the, with the money he's, he's taxing. No, and what you've seen, uh, a big stat that came out of this is the under 30 crowd, which typically doesn't vote in runoffs and have a hard time getting out, had a 37% turnout in this runoff. And that also happened in Wisconsin this week. There was a big Supreme Court election up there for a judge. And the under 30 crowd really turned out hard and uh, – I think Republicans have been really surprised over the last week with Democrats being able to get out this young crowd. So I don't know what I think that the, says I think it's going Bernie forward, Sanders effect. Yeah, it's the Bernie Sanders effect. Exactly. How how this old man with with crazy hair, <clears throat> who's never worked outside of uh, of the public sector. No, never had a real, never had a private sector job, and is a millionaire, uh, by the way, with multiple. Homes all over oh, yeah. the place and yeah, worth worth millions of dollars. But I, I don't know how he inspires the the devotion that that he gets from people that are so young. I mean, I understand if if you're just an old you know old liberal, you'd like it. But Sanders is his is has made his political career being as far left as he possibly can and be, being a communist, mm-hmm. self admitted socialist. He has, and it's just this big city effect. I mean, Atlanta's the same way. San Francisco, the Cash App founder this week, Bob Lee, was stabbed to death just walking down a street in San Francisco. You know, we were in New York last week. New York's a beautiful city to me, but you can you can be in the middle of people and it's uh, gorgeous settings, and all of a sudden somebody's using the bathroom in the middle of the street, or you see somebody shooting up heroin on a sidewalk. We saw that multiple times this week. So it just shows that these big cities, is the crime rate, the, the drugs are just continuing to increase. And these Democrat mayors, these left-wing Democrat mayors are not doing anything about it. I have a hard time at, at the point we're at. What do we do? I mean, if someone, if someone really wanted to, to solve these problems, what do we do? Yeah, what is the answer? Well, I mean, just adding police officers, you can, I mean, you're going to lock up heroin addicts, lock up uh, uh, homeless people. I don't, I, I don't know. Yep. And I don't think that's the answer, right? Is uh, 
the United States already incarcerates more people than any other country in the world. So is that we definitely incarcerate enough people, but yeah, what do you do? This is not an easy answer to how do you stop people from shooting up in the sidewalk, shooting heroin on the sidewalk in New York? It, yeah. Well, well, as a, as a civil libertarian, yep. how do you, how do you balance the, the rights of the people and constraining government mm-hmm. and mix that with the idea that, you know, what needs to happen is, uh, is, is clear out these Hoover, Hoovervilles and, and, uh, uh, run this, run the folks off. So it's, it's, it's impossible to keep the, those two, those two thoughts are, are, are mutually exclusive. Right. You can't have both. You know, you don't want to be, you don't want to be in a police state, but you don't want somebody shooting up in front of your kid. Yeah. A lot of it comes back to mental health. I mean, most of, most of these people that are doing this have severe mental health issues. And again, from well, a, you don't, from a small you don't government a dump pers- on the sidewalk, right. <laughs> Being in the right mind. He, yeah. I mean, there, there's, I, we, we, we see it in LA, San Francisco, uh, New York, obviously Chicago and, and Atlanta, to, like you said, to, to a certain extent. Yeah. There's parts of Atlanta that become very, uh, sketchy places. I don't want to go. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And, and, and Atlanta is, is, is a beautiful city. Yes. But I saw uh, something black on the ground. I was doing a job in Atlanta and looked at it. What what the hell is that? Uh, and it was, I saw it was, it was kind of moving. Said, what the hell is that? I got, got, uh, walked up a little closer to it and all the flies flew off. It was a giant piece of crap on on the sidewalk and it had so many flies on it. It looked like it, it, they looked like it, it was moving because the Jeez. flies, there were so, I mean, you couldn't see, you couldn't see, you couldn't see it with, with the flies on it. They covered a hundred percent of it. And that was not in a bad neighborhood. That was very close to Piedmont park. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Atlanta's where we go. If you know, we talked about, you know, go out for a good steak. I'm a snob. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, if, if I go out for steak somewhere, it's not Longhorn. No. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll get a piece of grilled chicken or a salad or something. If, if friends want to meet at Longhorn, it's fine with me. I mean, it's just, just if, I, if it's a, it's an occasion, I'll, I'll, I'll go to a, I'll go to a, a, a little higher end steakhouse. But anyway, the only place to do that is Atlanta and Buckhead. It is. Buckhead's the key. Buckhead or, uh, we go over to the east side of Atlanta now. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to be in the West End. No. I, told her, I just saw a dude at the West End driving through there, just pick up a bottle and throw it across the street. You have the West End where there's a lot of uh, gentrification going on, and that's a big topic in Atlanta. You know, is how is gentrification good for the community? What happens when areas get gentrified, and what effect does it have on the people there? So that's that's another topic that, and I know that whole West Side of Atlanta is where a lot of people are starting to move, and they're redoing that entire area. So you've got this big clash of of young kids out of college finding cheaper real estate, moving in, trying to change the environment or culture. And then you've got people that have been established there for 30, 40, 50 years. And those people are being rooted out of their homes. And then where do they go at that point? So gentrification is a huge topic in the Atlanta area. Oh, it is. Enough. And, and, and all the cities, mm-hmm. Hell, half the, uh, the episodes <clears throat> of, of shameless were, were about gentrification yep. and how it was raising the rents and running, uh, Running the the people that that have been there out. What that does is it is is it uh, uh it pushes criminal uh, uh, areas out further and further when, when they do that. Sort of like you know you kind of, you kind of knew when you hit the West End to go ahead and lock your doors. Um, that you know there there are neighborhoods. Back when tech, Techwood Homes was a thing, I mean, you you, you knew where you were, <laughs> and now it it could be anywhere. And that's, that's not. It's just it's it's it sort of migrates from decade to decade where the, where the bad neighborhoods are. Yeah, it does. Because and I worked in I, I lived in Kirkwood for a while, and uh, uh, it was funny because it was being gentrified at the time, and so when I would go on a jog in the morning. 
it was it was a uh, nice block crack block nice block crack block so I know that 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 process is a uh, uh, is a uh, uh, is painful all right so Buckhead city leader speaking of Buckhead is moving <laughs> on yes this is Bill white he's been the the main advocate behind the Buckhead secession for the last couple of years and forming a Buckhead city. This has been a hot topic in the state legislature, I guess, for three to four years now. Uh, it finally failed in the Senate this year. So the Senate took this up, it failed to pass the Senate. Bill White was the one behind that. I think Bill White has basically pissed off everybody in Buckhead at this point. So he said he's uh, out of the movement now. He's moving to North Georgia for a couple of years and then he's going to Sounds like eventually moves to Florida. So it sounds like the Buckhead City movement needs a new leader now, or it's just going to be done at this point. Uh, I think it's probably done for the next few years. Kemp was not a big fan of it. No, and he blamed Kemp going out. So Bill White was very critical of Governor Kemp putting his nose into that legislation. I don't know if you remember where Governor Kemp's office came out with a with a couple pages of why you should vote no on the Buckhead City bill. And that really riled up uh, even Lieutenant, you know, Lieutenant Governor Burt Jones, who was a proponent of the Buckhead, you know, Buckhead becoming its own city. It was a lot of, uh, a lot of strife in that process of governor kind of pitted against Lieutenant Governor. And then Bill White really blasted Governor Kemp on the way out. Yeah, well, I don't know if the new city is is the is the cure for all for, for for all of it, but if people want to add to their taxes, go for it. <laughs> that's what yeah, that's what it would have done. But they would have had their own private police force, and that's what they want. Yeah, that's what they wanted. They wanted more uh, policing in the bucket area. Yeah, I mean it, it was it was all well and fine as long as they were burning down you know down by Midtown and downtown by CNN, but when it got up to Buckhead, they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yep, and it sounds like the new mayor in Atlanta has put more focus on Buckhead. I think that's one of the reasons this bill, this session, didn't get a lot of movement, is Andre Dickens has worked with a lot of the legislators uh, in Atlanta to help them understand what he's doing with Buckhead at this point. So I think he's, he's taken a different tact and tone with Buckhead since he was elected mayor. Right. Uh, let's see. Huh. Kemp actually vetoed something. Yeah, so Governor Kemp vetoed House Bill 319. Uh, so this House Bill 319 would have required legislative approval for any college tuition increase that was greater than 3%. And he, he vetoed it because he said this is an executive responsibility that lies with the Board of Regents only. And the legislators should have no say in tuition increases for colleges around the state of Georgia. Well, it's interesting. That's that's the hill he he, he decided to die on. Uh, he's right. The legislature legislature when they came up with the board of regents gave that authority to the executive branch. Mm-hmm. But it's yeah. funny. So so we were just talking about getting involved in the legislative process as as an executive. Uh, sticking his nose in with, uh, when it comes to uh, it comes to the city of Buckhead, but when the uh, legislature uh, pushes back and he's like, "No, no, 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 that's my that's my privilege." <laughs> yeah, I, look, I've been I've been harping on how much power the governor has since before I was elected in 2019. Our governor appoints, and I, I'm a fan of Governor Kemp, so I'm not saying this in a negative way. I think Governor Kemp's done a good job, but the governor of Georgia appoints over a thousand people across the state of Georgia. The legislature needs to take back some of that power from the governor, and they need to do a lot of these appointments and monitoring of boards themselves and make that a legislative priority versus giving all this power, kind of just giving it to the governor saying, hey, governor, you've got it. You know, all this is in your purview. And it's fine when Republicans are in charge in Atlanta, but when Democrats come in charge, you really want a Stacey Abrams type person nominating and without any judicial or without any legislative approval, your head of the state patrol, head of DNR, head of prisons and the parole board, that's when it becomes an issue. So I wish the legislature would take back some of the power of the governor in Georgia. 
problem is you've got to have something that is uh, uh, overridable. Yep. And I don't, <clears throat> I don't think there's much that is. The only scenario I see that coming up would be if if Republican lost an election. Right. Yeah. If, if, the, if the governor's seat changes, they would immediately have a special session and strip the governor of a lot of powers, but that's not going to occur until the, the governor's mansion changes to blue. Yeah. And look, it, it's, it, this is cyclical, <laughs> you know, Republicans need to remember that they will be on the out. Yep. You know, we, we, we see that with Cobb County, especially Cobb County is, is turning more and more blue. And it could be all the, the refugees from Buckhead, <laughs> moving up to Cobb. Yeah. What is that? Is that up or across? I always get my map confused. It's probably more across, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, it, literally part of it's just across the river and to end East Cobb. But it's a, uh, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't mind him use, using his veto pen. I, I would, you know, it shouldn't make news when he does. Cause, cause, uh, <laughs> it's, it, it's so damn rare. Yes, it, governors do not veto bills passed by Republican assemblies much. So this is a very rare occurrence. Well, now we have inmates dipping out on the GDC. Three inmates have escaped in the last two weeks. Yeah, this is three, se- three separate occasions. It's not three people who snuck out. No, this is three separate occasions. And the reason I mention this is I know Jessica covers uh, this a lot in her reporting at the Georgia Virtue Dot com, but this week, yeah, three prisoners have basically just walked away. One of them has been apprehended so far. I think Aaron Lee Four, uh, he escaped from a, a prison around Milledgeville, and he was actually sentenced for rape. Uh, but he's been caught. But the other two, I don't think, as of this recording, have been found yet. Well, one guy left a transitional facility. Yes. I mean, you're done. Yeah, I know. He was You're- done. Yes, I know. Yeah, a couple of these guys were almost at the end of their sentence. Uh, one of the guys was uh, serving five years for multiple offenses. He was almost done. Like you said, uh, Charles Smith, who escaped from a transitional facility, he was almost done. Well, I don't know what's going through these guys' minds. Uh, and also, you know, from a security standpoint, it seems to be a pattern lately with more inmates escaping. Yeah, well... In the case of Charles Smith, uh, he was a uh, uh, he's in, had got life with possibility of parole, obviously, uh, for a murder committed November fourteenth, nineteen ninety two. Right. At, at fifty two years old, I mean, he's lived his entire adult life behind bars. It could be a, a situation where he knows he's going to get caught. He knows he's going to get sentenced. He wants to go back to prison. Yeah, it could have been because he was paroled on March sixteenth. I walked out, you know, a couple of days ago. So I, I don't understand what he was going through. This may have been, I just want to stay in jail. Yeah, this is, this is home now. Yep. Um, as far as the work detail, that's once you're labeled an escapee, you're, you're not getting out, out on a work detail again. <laughs> no more weed eating on the side of the road. No, and I think that's that's a that's a privileged position. It is. I used to work at a, a city-owned golf course where we have prisoner labor come cut grass on the golf course, and I asked one of the guys one day, "Is this a privileged position?" Like you just said, and they were like, "Yeah, all the guys want to come out here and work on the golf course, even though you're hot, sweaty, middle summer, weed eating, creek beds." The guys loved it because they got outside all day. So this is a very privileged position. Yeah, and he just he just pissed that away. And, and again, he was on a f- five year hitch. And, and I'm not saying that that doing you know I could do five years in my head. I, I don't I, I don't want to spend a night in jail. <laughs> Me either. Um, so I'm not making light of it, but come on, man. I mean, hold it together and, and get and get released. So I I don't know. With the uh, with the uh, uh, with the GDC, I don't know how to fix it. That's just, just like the cities. Uh, you almost have to blow it up mm-hmm. and start over. And I, uh, I mean, from the 
from the from the command on down. I just don't know how to do that. I mean, I have, you know, if I had a magic wand, yes, it'd be no, no more victimless crimes. Period. Right. Uh, that with that, and no more private prisons. No more policing for profit. No more but how, ticket cameras. I agree. Yeah. Pl- yeah. I mean, I don't like, I'm a, I'm with you. No more private prisons. I, I think if the state's going to jail people, I think they ought to be state run prisons and not private prisons. <clears throat> I've never been a fan of the private prison system in Georgia. No, it's uh, most things. I tell you, I, I want to go private. That should be in the public sector. When you're depriving someone of their freedom, that onerous needs to be on the uh, onus needs to be on the state. It does. Uh, so that's. I I, I don't envy uh, people at the, uh, the that are on the board for GDC. Yeah, they've got they've got a mess in their hands. They do. And 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 we don't hear about this stuff because again, everybody's so so tied into national politics. You know, if we, if we didn't have folks like Jessica out there who's who's bringing this up, bringing it out, that's this is what's going on. People just kind of act like prisons don't exist. Right. No, they that do. Used I mean, to, yeah, you're 100 correct. So we have Robert F. Kennedy Jr. to challenge Biden. <laughs> yeah, so I was kind of uh, surprised this came up this week. So Robert Kennedy is, if you remember, is the son of the assassinated 1968 presidential candidate, presidential candidate, U.S. Senator Robert F. Kennedy. And all the headlines this week were interesting because they said lawyer and vaccine skeptic. So that's how they're that's how they're describing Robert F. Kennedy Jr. as a lawyer and vaccine skeptic. But he's the first, I guess, well known or well named person to challenge uh, President Joe Biden, along with who, who David Marianne Williamson. She's also entered the race as a Democrat. She's running on hope and love. I think is her campaign slogan. She's very. She seems very nice, but she's out of her damn mind. <laughs> yeah, she was very entertaining in the last. Set. She she made the debates last time and was very entertaining in the debates. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if any more Democrats jump in. Well, uh, known Democrats, I think they're seeing a chink in the armor for Joe Biden, and we'll have to see over the next three or four months if anybody else jumps in the race that has a chance. I don't think either one of these do. Uh, but I would like to see him on a stage debating Biden. I assume that's not going to happen, though. Usually, I don't know. We're, we're again, we're 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 so far down the rabbit hole at this point. I can't even say what usually happens because it's it's an <laughs> there's un, no it's usual. unusual situation. Yeah, there's no you've usual a, anymore. If you've got a a eighty year old man in decline, that we can all see it. Uh, and we've, we've, we've never, we've never had that where, where everybody around him was looking at him like this, this dude fell off a bicycle when he was sitting still. It's not like he, not like he was jumping ramps or anything with it. No, he's Fall, declined falls going then. upstairs. Multiple times. Yeah. If he was yeah. younger, we'd accuse him of being a drinker. Just so, ice yeah. cream at this point. Yeah, it's just ice cream. Yes, but but that that'll be an interesting race to watch. Uh, you have down here so far: Asa Hutchinson, Nikki Haley, Perry Johnson, Vivek Ramaswamy have declared for the Republican side. Yeah, and I don't know. You know, the only, the only name I really know on there is Nikki Haley. I know who Vivek is. He's not a politician by nature. I've heard of Asa Hutchinson before. You know why and Perry Johnson, I have no idea who Perry Johnson is, but all this is doing, you know, the one everybody's waiting on, I guess, is Ron DeSantis to see if he declares for president. Dave, I don't know when that will occur, and I, I don't know if Ron's jumping in a race or not. I, with all the Trump stuff, it, it's hard to tell what's going to happen with this Republican primary next year. And look, I don't mind a, a strenuous primary to, to vet the uh, the candidates. But you know the 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 only people who are polling anywhere are Trump and DeSantis. That's it. It's a two it's a two person race in the Republican Party. I mean, everything everybody else is is dividing the the 
I won't say anti-Trump because I don't, I don't think any of them are, are, are anti-Trump. Um, but you're going you're to divide the the uh, uh, the folks who are going to vote against Trump, mm-hmm. and I yeah. and that may weaken uh, weaken the party a little bit. I think the only other Republican that could get any support is a Mike Pence, but I, I'm not sure what I'm not sure which Republican kind of group he pulls from though is I I don't know either other than he uh uh he ref- allegedly re- refused to uh act extra constitutionally uh, uh with certifying yeah, right. the election and who's the guy in New Jersey that everybody wants to run uh used to be the governor of New Jersey Chris Christie I I, I don't know if Chris Christie can get any support either I I don't I wouldn't put Chris Christie and run in the same sentence. <laughs> no, that's never occurred. So I'm like you. I think it's a two man race in the Republican Party. All these other well, people are like dividing up one or two percent. I don't even think they're dividing ten percent up. Yeah. Well, DeSantis also lost weight. You know, there's been been a visible di- a difference in him. I mean, he's he's you know skipping around the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, he's, he sure is acting like it, but I, but he, he is. campaign finance laws and a lot of a lot of other rules that go into running for president kick in after you after you declare. Yeah, I think he's trying to hold out as long as possible. So I think and look, the primary is what a year from now. So uh, when does that, when does the voting start? Probably next March. So we still got eleven months to go. And I'm like you, he's already running as a presidential candidate, even if he hasn't declared that he's a presidential candidate. Right. And, you know, it's, he, he may decide to keep his powder dry. Yeah, he may. He, be, and he doesn't know if he can run and also serve as Florida's governor yet. So we're still researching to see if he can do both at the same time. So, you know, if he can't do both at the same time, I assume he's going to stay Florida's governor for the next two or three years. Yeah, and then you uh, you back whoever the nominee is, uh, and most likely it's, uh, it'd be, it would be Trump. And then in uh, in four years, you you go in with his endorsement to 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 run. Yep. Yeah, I I don't. Yeah, I I don't know. I don't know about that race. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> uh, this is a good time to remind you that these are our opinions and not those of anyone not on the show or any respective company for which we may work, own, or otherwise associate ourselves with on a regular or irregular basis. Also, you can find other stories and relevant or, uh, uh, relevant stories and other episodes over the georgiavirtue.com. It's not like I haven't said that 263 times. <laughs> Good job, as usual. So we've got the Mule of the Week. Yeah, this is, a, this is a pretty easy one for me. It's not a person. It's actually a company. But the mule of the week for me is Anheuser-Busch, who is the owner of Bud Light. It came out this week and, and featured Dylan Mulvaney, who is a, a, a guy that parades around dressed up as a girl and does crazy stunts. And they, uh, they said they, they, you know, they celebrated Dylan for being a woman for 365 days for one year. And actually put Dylan's uh, face on a Bud Light can. <laughs> you know, this was uh, this has kind of lit up Twitter this week. Uh, we've had a lot of people coming out on both sides of this saying, you know, Bud Light doesn't know their audience. Bud Light's audience is a bunch of middle-aged guys sitting around or, you know, college students drinking beer out of red Solo cups. And so it's brought up quite a bit of controversy this week with Anheuser-Busch doing this. There is no bad publicity. No, there's not. And, uh, you know, there's been, you know, Dylan's also, if you, if you have watched his rise over the last year, he's also sponsored by Jack Daniels, Tampax, uh, even though he, he had, he's been giving out tampons to women and quite a few other organizations. So yeah, this, this is a strange one. I mean, there's so many women that Bud Light, and Anheuser Busch could feature as strong women if they wanted to go that direction. Think of all the, even the women in our lives' days, like our wives, uh, people I work with. There's national women. Nikki Haley is a good example of a, a very strong 
woman out there, uh, Kamala Harris, vice president, instead of featuring any of these women, they feature a guy dressed up, sort of making fun of women on their Bud Light cans. I, it makes no sense to me. Yeah, look, I don't drink Bud Light. I really don't, I don't think I drink any Anheuser-Busch product. Uh, it's not because of this. I just don't. <laughs> but the people who are, who are protesting have no idea all the brands that AB has. Oh, they have a ton. Yep. If they're so going to stop made... drinking Anheuser Busch, they better look at the list of products that they sell. Right. Yeah. That, that, uh, you know, you got a note on here the, uh, the go woke, go broke is the dumbest statement ever. Yeah. I think, I mean, all my conservative friends, I saw them on Facebook this week saying, go woke, go broke. Nobody's going broke by going woke. Anheuser Busch will be just fine. And, I think what people are missing is these companies don't care that they're really pissing off their current client base and making their current client base upset. It's not about that anheuser Bush. It's really about reshaping the culture that we're living in and making people like Dylan normal. So they would much rather shape the culture around us for the next 10, 15, 20 years than irritate a couple of clients that they've got now. So I think we're very short-sighted to say, go woke, go broke. That doesn't happen. Uh, Target, what Target was it five or six years ago, Dave, allowed men to go into the women's bathrooms. Everybody said that would be the end of Target. It wasn't the end of Target. This won't be the end of Anheuser-Busch. It won't be the end of Nike for sponsoring Dylan or Jack Daniels. But what it will do is reshape the culture around us where guys dressing up like women And doing stupid stuff is normalized. And that's what they're trying to do. And women should be the biggest people that are upset. I don't know. Look, I'm upset about it. But women out there should be upset that some kid is out there mocking them uh, and getting all this support and publicity by well-known brands. The one that shocks me is Tampax. (laughs) Yeah, me too. He doesn't menstruate. No, not at all. Yeah, Dylan, I mean... Yeah, visited the White House, right? I mean, Joe, President Joe Biden had Dylan visit the White House in 2022. Think how insulting that is to women. Well, <clears throat> Kamala Harris giving a a courage award to a dude, right? It was supposed to be recognizing women, and gave it to a dude, a dude in a dress, right? Jack Daniels is kind of curious to me why why they would get involved in it. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I just yeah, don't, I have no clue. I don't see the upside for them is, is the thing. But look, Disney is, when I looked as we record, uh, Disney was up. It was at, at a, I think it was what I said, it was 100, 100 bucks a share. Uh, it's not hurting their investors. Uh, people are still spending ten fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 go down to Disney for a week. Yep. I don't think companies, I think this is what it is. I don't think companies can stay neutral anymore in this culture game. So I think the left looks at a company like Anheuser-Busch. They look at a company like Disney and they have ratings on these companies of, of how culturally sensitive they are to issues that they support. And what's happening is, is a company like Anheuser-Busch, they can't be in the middle anymore. They can't just say, Hey, I'm not taking a side in the culture game. So to get, you know, to make themselves look good to the left, they have to do stuff like this to get their cultural awareness points. And that's what you see all these companies doing is they just cannot stay neutral anymore. It's not good enough to sit in the middle and just sell beer. It's not good enough just to sell whiskey or just to sell tampons. You have to take a cultural stand and the cultural stand they're taking is from the left because they are much scared of the left coming after them than they are of the right coming after them. So I think that's what we've got now is these companies are just terrified of not uh, looking like they support all these causes of the left. Yeah. uh, It just, it it doesn't, it it doesn't make sense to me. I mean, when Delta started getting involved with, 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 with different stuff, I'm like, just fly airplanes. Yeah. Get me from point A to B. That's what, that's good. Safely, comfortable, and hopefully with a cocktail. 
Exactly. Or a couple. Yep. <laughs> You're 100% but, right. But you had Kid Rock blow up a case of Budweiser. Travis Tritt dropped the Bud Light from concerts. I mean, so it will, I mean, losing concerts will 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 cost them. But again, AB is so big. That it's uh, that it's it's, it's a, be a mosquito bite, and you know with a twenty four hour news cycle. Oh, this uh, will be gone will, by next week. Yeah, it, we'll, we'll be on. We'll be on to the to the to the next culture war. Yes. You also said down Biden is making a rule change to Title Nine. Yeah, I thought this was interesting. So a lot of states are coming out saying that uh, you know, transgender girls cannot compete. So boys basically can't compete in girls' sports. So he's made a title to change or made a rule change to Title IX, which will allow all transgender women to play girls' sports. So if a school system comes out and says that's not, you can't do that anymore, then they will risk losing federal funding coming in. So that's a kind of an interesting way of coming about this. And and what was strange is I saw AOC came out against President Biden doing this. So this is another one that kind of struck me as odd that the left would come out against this and the right's upset about it. So I've definitely got to look at the uh, ramifications of president Biden making this rule change to title nine. And if it's even legal and if it's legal, yep. You know, does, is that within, within the purview of the executive branch just to make, just to make a, a rule change on a rule change. title nine? Yes. It goes against state laws that are being passed. So the big news over the last month is Donald Trump got smacked with 34 felony charges. Yeah, we so did not we were get, up at, Yeah, go ahead, Dave. We did not get a perp walk. No photo not either, and, right? No, not handcuffed and not photographed. But he, uh, he uh, pled not guilty. No kidding. Yeah, and it was 34 felony counts of falsifying or falsifying business records in the first degree, <clears throat> which is only a felony if it was done to and with the with the intent to conceal or commit another crime. But the DA Alvin Bragg didn't really list what that other crime is, so he basically charged him with 34 felony counts of doing something that uh, was with the intent of committing another crime, but nobody knows what the other crime is. It's very strange here of how he's kind of twisting the law to fit this indictment. Yeah. Is, uh, this was not a, uh, see a crime, investigate a crime. This was see somebody now dig, find something. Yes, exactly what this is. So it's, uh, even Stormy Daniels doesn't think he's guilty. Now, she's not exactly the legal expert. <laughs> she didn't get her law degree from uh, Harvard Law? No, no. turns out she wasn't working her way through school. Um, yeah, I, I think you don't know this, but that's, that, that's, what, that's what every stripper says. Oh, I'm working my way through school. Yeah, I think even left-wing lawyers that I saw on Twitter this week thinks these charges are very iffy. But I also saw that everybody thinks he'll be convicted of them. So he probably sh- this should probably be thrown out. But if, if Trump can't get this trial moved out of Manhattan, then he's probably going to be convicted of all 34 charges. So everybody thinks it's bullshit charges. Sorry, Eric. Um, but they also think he'll be convicted of these charges. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't know, Dave. Next court appearance is in December, though. So we have, what, from April to December to see what happens next. Yeah, and, and at that time, I guess they'll figure out if he's a, if he's a viable candidate. I, I, don't, I don't know how much money he's got in the campaign account. Uh, this can be very, very, very unless, they, unless they get something with lesser, lesser included charges, unless they give the jury the option of smacking with a misdemeanor. Right. I don't, I, I don't know how you put a, a, a former president in jail. I, we talked about it last week and it's been talked about on the, with the pundits. How, what do you do? Have secret service sit in a cell with him? <laughs> and the best comparison I heard was like, so he's got a jail cell like the one in Goodfellas. 
where they're sitting there slicing up the uh, <laughs> the garlic with a Sli- with a with a razor blade. Yes, yeah, cooking up the t bones on the fire. Yeah, this is. Uh, I mean, with the next court appearance in December, you can't imagine this case will be go to trial until sometime in twenty twenty four. So he'll be middle, he'll be probably in the middle of a presidential run against Joe Biden if everything shapes out like it looks like it is, with having to go to court in New York. And then on top of that, I think this would probably speed up the indictment of Donald Trump in Atlanta potentially. So he could also be indicted by Fonnie Willis in Atlanta uh, within before the end of twenty twenty three. Yeah, I don't know. I, I. I... <laughs> Neither of these DAs can 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 honestly say it's not a it's not a political witch hunt. Oh, uh, total. And I saw one of the congressmen asked the head of uh, one of the branches up in D.C. this week. They said, "Well, is it a crime to lie on your the form that you fill out when you're buying a weapon?" And it, it's a federal crime to lie. You know it is. It, like if you're filling out that form, it asks you if you do drugs, and if you put. No, if they find out you were doing drugs, it's a federal crime to lie on your background check form. And they said, well, why have you guys not prosecuted Hunter Biden yet? Because he admitted to doing drugs, to buying a pistol, and lying on his background check form. So it just shows that this justice system that we've got now, it's going after certain people, and then certain people are good. So it's just the judicial system we got in the U.S. right now is a total disaster. Yeah, I mean, I don't know the 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 cure to it because you know they, they, they this is what they want. They want to hang his head on the wall. Uh, it, the 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 women of the View uh, collectively wet their depends uh, <laughs> when uh, when the the felony felony counts were were uh, uh, were released. Oh yeah, they're, and, they're, but their combined IQ is what less than a hundred. I don't know how yeah. anybody watches that show. I don't know, man. I, just the fact that it's still on the air makes me doubt the the long term survivability of of the human beings. <laughs> if aliens, so what you're saying right now is, if aliens landed on planet Earth, they would probably go back to where they came from if they saw what was going on. Oh no, we're we're the we're the trailer park of the of the universe. <laughs> And not, and not even a nice trailer park either. <sighs> That's funny. Uh, so we've got a Marjorie Taylor Greene update. Uh, she is, uh, represents the 14th district. Yeah, Marjorie. And, so, uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. As I say, and of course, I've, I've, let's just know she, she's my congresswoman. Yeah, Marjorie's so interesting to me. And I, I've met her before, been to her office in D.C., She's got a very cool office. She's got people from all over the country write her letters of support. She puts all these letters on the outside of her office, inside her office. You know, I never know what to think about Marjorie, because if you look at her voting record, she really stands up with probably my favorite representative, which is Thomas Massey out of Kentucky. She has incredible liberty voting record, conservative voting record. She does everything you want from a congresswoman or somebody representing you. She's a dove. Yes, but then she has this other kind of personality that is Donald Trumpish, right? It's, I want to do everything I can to draw attention to myself. I'm going to uh, raise a gazillion dollars, and I'm going to say the craziest things I can say to get attention. And I can't quite swear up those two uh, or align those two different personalities of hers. Uh, it, it's just she's... I don't know what to think about her sometimes. Yeah, she's in that she's in that group with uh, Bobert and, and the 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 folks that were on the outside. Mm-hmm. She did a very political thing when she supported McCarthy early. Yeah, she did. Uh, so maybe she's maybe she's growing into the job. Yeah, she seems to be growing on the job. Um, well, you know, Trump being there doesn't help her because I think she has to. She has to chase him around the country, right? She was in New York this week. And again, this is one of the things that she does when she's, she's, she says, you know, she t- started talking about Nelson Mandela was arrested. Jesus was arrested. And then she went to Trump. So, you know, comparing Trump to those two people that were uh, 
you know, to Nelson Mandela and Jesus, it's sort of different, right? So while I don't mind her going up there and supporting Trump, then she opens her mouth and says something that's completely off base. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, she's very interesting. She's she she's raised over twelve million dollars through twenty twenty two. So she's one of these candidates that you know is an incredible fundraiser. She gets all these small dollar donations, which Democrats have always historically been very good at doing. She contributes money to the party. Uh, she does a lot of good things and then goes off the range or off the ranch with other stuff. So she's really an enigma to me. Yeah. She got sucked into that QAnon stuff. She did. Uh, and, 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 and bad too. I mean, she, she was deep into it, but you know, I, I think she's admitted, I think she's admitted that. Yeah. That wasn't, that wasn't the, that wasn't the best she thing. Did. And she's, and, and right. She's making a killing for, for, one for the party, two for for her reelection campaign. Yep. I, I, even the guy that the Democrat that ran against her, he checked a lot of boxes uh, with being a, a army veteran and Democrat. Uh, he checked a lot of boxes, and I, he, I don't know what where he polled thirty five percent or something yeah, like I that. Yeah, I think it was thirty five percent. Yeah, so not a bunch. So she's good in her district as long as she keeps the support. And, you know, I mean, to me, this shows a challenge that representatives like Thomas Massey have, like Marjorie have, that if you if you go to D.C. or you go to Atlanta and you do vote a very conservative voting record or a liberty-based voting record, you don't get any campaign contributions from the lobbyist organizations that run the place. So what Marjorie has done is she said, hey, I know I'm not getting anything from the insiders, so I need to go out here and be as flamboyant as possible to raise money from normal, you know, everyday people out there that support someone like me. So I think that just shows a challenge that a lot of representatives have is how do you, how do you stay ideology or how do you, how do you keep your ideology, but also how do you potentially raise money? And like we all know, money wins elections. So I think that's the challenge to a lot of representatives like herself is how do you do both? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, Let's be honest. Just like we we're talking about the Dylan dude, he, you know, what's his claim to fame? Doing stupid stuff on TikTok, right? So, when when Marjorie was first elected, uh, she did a video of doing burpees in her hotel room or something, or <laughs> right, uh, get, just get, getting in people's in people's faces with with uh, uh, with and, and that sort of craziness has been turned down. I mean, it was it was at a uh, a spinal tap said turned up to 11. <laughs> so she's, she's toned some of that down, but I'm telling you that the, the people out here love her. They, they, there's a, there's a thirst for pl- plain spoken politicians. There is a hundred percent agree. There's people like Marjorie because they can relate to her. She talks their language and like you said, when we went and visit her in D.C., she was as charming and as nice as she could be. My son enjoyed talking with her. And she's that way on the campaign trail. She's relatable where a lot of people aren't. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you talk about the aloof princess we had with uh, Loeffler. Kelly, yeah. does this hat make me look poor, Loeffler? <laughs> right. Wearing a you know, $500 blue jeans to a campaign event in rural Georgia. With a you yep. know a sports jacket that costs a thousand dollars, yes, just she's not relatable at all. And Marjorie is relatable, and that's why she keeps getting all the support she's got, and why donations continue to flow into her campaign. She's a hundred percent relatable to a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, and she she talks the way these folks talk. Yep. When they when they when they get to better, get together with friends, that's 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 the way they talk, and they hear that they hear that in, in Margie and. And yeah, those dollars go flying in. Mm-hmm. All right, Ken, you got your, got your closing thought? Yes, I, I saw this this week. If uh, anyone picks up a new copy of Gone with the Wind, it's going to have a new trigger warning on it. So uh, the Arthur Mitchell decided not to alter the book to take out all the content that would trigger people. Uh, but there is going to be a warning on the inside that this book has shocking elements and romantic romanization of a shocking era in our history. 
So there's a big movement going on in the country now to make sure that any books that were written with questionable content are things that go against today's cultural cultural standards that we either go back and put trigger warnings in books or we just alter that content. That's my closing thought. I, I never thought we'd be at the point where we had to put trigger warnings in books that were written, but we are there. It's gone with the wind. <laughs> Exactly. Well, I mean, it, it's about Antebellum South. What? Yes. What? What? What do you expect it to be? I don't know. I, I think trigger warnings are stupid. I do too. <clears throat> if you're triggered, that's on you. You're in charge of your feelings. Yes. Well, uh, talk to Ron Davis, former uh, county commissioner out here. Uh, he and his wife Kirsten just got back from Dominican Republic. Uh, building ball fields uh, for, you know, for a lot of these kids, baseball is their, is their way out. It is. And they were down there with Dale Murphy. Oh, that's cool. And, uh, and, and got to, and got to know him really well as they were working on, working on that stuff. And said Murph was the first one out there pushing wheel, wheelbarrows and Murphy's no spring chicken. No, he's gotta be mid sixties now. Is that, <sighs> I think he's a little older than that. I think he's uh, uh, in his seventies. Wow, uh, I'd, I'd have to look up directly. I mean, it's not it's not heard, like I have. Uh, I've always Murph's heard birthday. great stuff against Dale Murphy. Though I've always heard really good things about him. Oh yeah, Re- really gives his time back. And for those kids, it's it, it is it, it's life changing because mm-hmm. you know, you know for these kids to get get picked up either World Baseball Classic and get a chance to get exposure or get picked up and and look, we draft kids who are fifteen years old now. Right. Yeah, they're they in Yeah, 14, 15 years old. Yeah. And Latin America is a, is a is a feeder system for for MLB. So we you know it's, it, but it was a really real cool thing they did uh going to the orphanages go, go, going around the country. You know, I think they did take a day or a day at the beach or an afternoon at the beach, but but really while they were down there, they were they were uh they were, they were working and they were and they're in orphanages and, and all that stuff. So good on, on Ron and Kirsten Davis. Yeah, very good. Super, That's awesome. Good work. Super good pe- people. And Kirsten was on the show. She she does uh, homeschooling, so she was on the show some time ago talking about that. So she's not a complete stranger to, to the audience. But as we're running long, we give a big thank you to uh, Eric Cumbie, who's got a couple things to, to clean up on, on the edit. And Ken Pullen, my partner in this endeavor. I'm Dave Roberts. Have a great week. Catch me howling at the moon